All right, now we're in section four, the rise of the church, the rise in the power of the church. <clears throat> now, actually, the church has had a great deal of power in the medieval society ever since the fall of the Roman Empire in the West, because the Roman army moves out. It's often left to the church officials to step in and fill the power vacuum that the Romans leave behind. But what we do see that during the high Middle Ages, the popes are going to try and expand their power even further, and that's the story we're going to focus on in this lesson. One of the best ways to think about the growth of the church in power in the high Middle Ages is through a series of conflict that the church has. And at each conflict, the church is going to try and grow its power. And we'll kind of walk through these conflicts and look to the extent which they are successful in achieving their goal. So our first conflict is a conflict with the East, and they're going to focus here with Pope Leo IX as our example of this conflict. The goal that Pope Leo IX had is papal supremacy. He wants to have the Pope be the leader of all Christianity. Now, we mentioned when we talked about the rise of the Byzantines that one of the legacies of the Byzantine Empire is that there's a division that's created between the East and West, and one of those divisions has to do with religious leadership. The people living in the East in the Byzantine Empire, particularly in Constantinople, look at the patriarch of Constantinople as their main religious and spiritual leader, whereas those living in the Western Empire look at the Pope as the main spiritual leader. And both the patriarch and the Pope take titles signifying leadership both patriarch and pope mean father, and that and by taking this title of father, both these bishops are <clears throat> making a claim that, you know, we're in a leadership over Christianity. So what ends up happening here during the time period of Pope Leo IX is he actually sends a delegation to the patriarch and demands that the patriarchy recognize the authority of the pope over all Christianity. And when the pope's representatives arrive, the patriarch, <clears throat> and, and they tell the, the patriarch that the pope's in control of Christianity, the patriarch says, no, no, he's not. I'm in charge of Christianity. I'm the patriarch of Constantinople. It's a major city. I should be the leader of all Christians. And this is basically going to create a schism or a split. We call it the Great Schism of 1054. And it splits Christianity into two types of Christianity. On one side, you have Roman Catholicism, which is represented by the orange on this slide. And the Roman Catholics will look at the Pope as their main leader. And on the other side, you have the Eastern Orthodox Church, who are going to look at the patriarch. Um, and they're going to look at him as the main leader. And so in this instance, we see that what really happens is the popes fail to gain, fail in the goal to expand their power. They're able to solidify power over the western part of Europe, but they can't establish it in the Byzantine Empire and in the area of modern-day Russia. I should also note that this split continues even to this very day. So it's a divide that has never been healed, and that has lasting consequences um, because of the schism of 1054. Uh, the second major conflict that the popes get involved with is with the kings. Now, we've already mentioned how there was a conflict between Pope and Henry II, and Henry tries to expand his power on the English church. It results in the murder of Thomas Becket, and that doesn't go well for Henry. And we mentioned how King John tries to appoint bishops in England, and that doesn't go well for him. So here we see another example of conflict with kings. It's and this time we're going to focus on Pope Gregory VII, and in particular look at his conflict with Henry IV, who is the German king of the Holy Roman Empire. So the goal here on the part of the Pope is to free the church from control of the kings, particularly free the papacy from control of the Holy Roman Empire, emperor. So here we have to kind of go to the time of Charlemagne. If you recall, we're discussing Charlemagne. We said Charlemagne came to the rescue of Pope Leo, and then the Roman emperors, the successors of Charlemagne, had some influence over the papacy, over the Pope. And so Gregory VII wants to get rid of that kind of influence. The conflict really starts to emerge when King Henry IV, the Holy Roman Emperor, starts to appoint bishops in the Holy Roman Empire. And also not just appointing bishops, but also giving the bishops the symbols of their authority. And this is what starts to known as the investi investiture controversy. And the investiture is simply a fancy word for talking about giving someone authority. And if you look at the image we're going to have up in the corner here, <clears throat> you can see it's the image of a king. And we notice how he is giving the bishop his staff here. Now, the staff is a symbol of the bishop's spiritual authority. So by giving the bishop his staff, by investing the bishop with the symbols of his office, the king is essentially making the statement that he is more powerful than the church. Because remember, whoever gives something in that a position of power is the person who's in charge. And so Henry starts by not only appointing bishops, but investing them with the symbols of authority. And this gets the pope very upset. Now, the king's response to this is that he has a perfect right to invest the bishops with their authority because the bishops, after all, are vassals to the king. So it was not uncommon for bishops to become vassals of the king. They would get grants of land. Uh, these grants were actually known as uh, benefices because they couldn't be passed by successors. Keep in mind, bishops are supposed to be celibate, so they're not supposed to have any uh, heirs or any children, so they wouldn't have sons to hand land to anyway. But the idea is that every time there's a new bishop being chosen, 
that new bishop would get, take an oath of fealty, and that in return would get the benefices. They'd grant the land to them by, uh, for use. And so the king said, you know, the process of investing a bishop, he was giving the bishop some political authority as a vassal to the king, but he's also, by giving the staff, kind of stating that the, not only was he giving the bishop political authority, but giving him spiritual authority as well, which is putting him up in a level above the church. So this really sparks major controversy, and Pope Gregory absolutely says you have to stop doing this. Henry refuses to stop appointing bishops and investing them with symbols of their office. The pope responds by excommunicating Henry. Now, excommunication is essentially the pope saying to the king, you're kicked out of the church, which means you're no longer you know, a Christian. And so when you die, you're not going to go to heaven. And this meant, that, meant to be a punishment. But Henry, and you know, to get him to beg for forgiveness. But Pope Gregory goes even further than just excommunicating the king. He tells the king's nobles they no longer have to be loyal to the king because by being kicked out of the church, he's not a good man. So the Pope tells Henry's nobles, you don't have to be loyal to him anymore. And many of the nobles actually kind of are pleased with this because they don't have to be loyal to the king. This means they can expand their own power. So Henry ends up being in a very bad situation. He has to go and ask forgiveness from the Pope because if he doesn't, he's in danger of being kicked out of power. And so Henry goes to meet with the Pope and we have you know, a woodcut image of him coming to the Pope's palace in Kenosha. The Pope makes him come barefoot just as a sign of humility. It makes him wait outside for three days before he's willing to see him. <laughs> to, again, kind of make a claim that the, post, that the Pope is more powerful than the king. So in this particular conflict between Pope Gregory and Henry, we do see Gregory coming out on top. Now, later on, it's, quite, it's not quite a, as rosy of a picture that I painted for the Pope. Even after the Pope and Henry make peace, Henry still tries to get rid of Pope Gregory, and both of them will end up dying, and the conflict will still continue. Eventually, their successors will sort of make peace and basically say whenever a new bishop gets his job that the king can give him the symbols of political authority, but the Pope or his representative will give the bishop the symbols of spiritual authority. So they kind of have a split ceremony, and it's important because you start to see that the kings are trying to grow their power. They're coming into conflict with the power of the church, um, and at least at this point, the church is going to continue to be on top. Now, this is really something that's going to be covered on the, this, that, you know, on the exam, but it's not really, but I want, think it's important to see the types of power that are being claimed by the popes. So around the time of the investiture controversy, Pope Gregory is issuing a document called the Dictates of the Pope. It's a list of all the powers that he's claiming for himself. So it's just a small example of some of these powers that he's claiming. One thing, notice that he says he has the power to dep depose and reinstate bishops. Basically, he's saying he gets to pick the bishops and make sure they're doing their jobs, and if they're not, he can fire them. He claims that the Pope is the only one that can, be, can use imperial insignia. Um, it's also a direct challenge against the power of the Holy Roman Emperor because the Pope is basically saying, I'm the Emperor. Uh, I'm the one who gets to make use of these symbols of the Empire. Not only the Holy Roman Empire, but he's also talking about the Roman imperial symbols that he's saying only the Pope should be able to use. He says that all princes shall kiss the feet of the Pope. By kissing his feet, it's a sign of submission, a sign of humility. And so saying the Pope is more powerful than the political authorities, including the kings. It says the Pope has the power to depose emperors. Basically, he can kick emperors out of power, which shows how you can, uh, how you know he's claiming he's more powerful than kings. He's also claimed um, that no church council can be called without the Pope's express order. The Pope only the Pope can call a church council, like the Council of Nicene was called by Constantine. Emperor Constantine called that council, and that was not unusual for kings who were the ones to initiate church councils in the Roman Empire. But now the Pope's saying no. You know, we're more powerful than the secular authorities are, so only the Pope can call for a church council. Statement that the Pope himself can be, can maybe judged by no one except God. So I put in brackets that you can see he's not, you know, he's not saying he's above everybody, but, you know, no human person can judge the Pope. The Pope is only judged by God. And really what he's saying is there's no one on earth more powerful than the Pope. The document also claims that anyone who is not at peace with the Roman Catholic Church shall not be considered Catholic. Uh, Catholic with a small c means that part of the body of Christ. <clears throat> so what he's saying here is that you can't go to heaven, you can't be a Roman part of Roman Catholicism if, you, if the Pope excommunicates you. That means you don't get to go to heaven. Popes are really seizing power over uh, who gets to heaven and who doesn't. And finally, this document claims that the Pope has the power to absolve subjects from their fealty to wicked men. So basically he says, I can get rid of the feudal contract. And um, you know, this was in particular when Henry IV, he excommunicates Henry IV. He basically says, you're a wicked man, and your nobles don't have to abide by their oath of loyalty to you. And so it's a really interesting document about how the Pope is making these claims to these enormous powers. And, and now the question becomes, can the Pope actually carry out these kinds of powers? 
uh, you know, can he write a document that's basically, you know, that says this? And so in the case of this, Gregory comes out on top. But we're going to see while the popes are claiming all these powers, they actually uh, don't always are not always able to exercise them. And especially when you get to the late Middle Ages, we're going to see a lot of this was just kind of wishful thinking. Another conflict is the conflict with heresy. And one of the best examples of this is to look at the example of Pope Innocent III. And he's going to create a uniformity of Christian belief and behavior. So it's not just a matter of that the popes want to be the leader of Christianity and that they want to see themselves as being more powerful than the kings. They want to control ordinary Christians and, <clears throat> and what they're believing, make sure that ordinary Christians are following and living out Christianity in a way that's acceptable to the papacy. Now, the goal is to implement uh, what he calls... Uh, by calling a church council, the Fourth Lateran Council, and it meets in 1215. And out of this council are, and the decisions, one of the decisions is that Catholics have to go to confession and mass at least once a year to remain in good standing with the church. And by requiring confession at least once a year, that means the priest that's checking in with every member of the con congregation makes sure they're living the way the church wants them to be living. And if not, they're going to have to confess to the priest, and he's going to be intervening by trying to correcting false beliefs or bad behavior. There's a measure of control that you can see that the church is trying to implement. Another thing is that it steps into the control of marriage. So traditionally, marriage was controlled by the state. In order to get married, you'd sign a marriage contract, and you were allowed to get married, but you would go to the church and then have your marriage blessed by the church. But it was actually a legal binding document. Well, what ends up happening is that the Fourth Lateran Council, the church starts to make the claim that if you want to go to the church to get married, your married if you don't go to the church, it's not legally valid. And so it's from this point forward that you start to see children who are born out of wedlock or really start to encounter a lot of difficulties prior. Um, if you are illegitimate, you could still technically inherit from your parents as long as they recognize you as their child, which is what happens with William the Conqueror, who was an illegitimate child. In fact, his first nickname was William the Bastard. But his dad recognizes him as a son, so this allows William to become Duke of Normandy. He goes off conquers England. But anyways... Um, the church steps into control of marriage, and this is going to have an impact on inheritance. So people are going to try from this point, you know, make sure they're married in the church so that their children will have marriage and can legally inherit. Another thing we see coming out of this council is the decision to implement discrimination practices against Jewish population in Europe. One of the things the council stipulates is that Jews should wear a special badge on their clothing to let everyone know that they're Jews and not Christians. Um, as you start to think about the Holocaust, and they don't go quite this far, but certainly the Nazis are not the first people to require Jews to wear something on their clothes. The Nazis actually borrowing the ideas from the Middle Ages. I should tell you that here too, when it comes to discrimination against Jews, we find that it did not vary, uh, that it did vary from place to place because the Pope Innocent says all Jews have to wear this on their clothing. Clothing. It does appear that not every nobleman actually made the Jews do this. Because what kind of shows you is the Church. They're trying to control everyone's behavior, but they're also they also have limits on their power. The final area we see is this create a sense of uniformity when it comes to belief. The Fourth Lateran Council calls for a crusade against the heresy of Europe, and we're going to talk about that crusade, and, it's, and that's called the fight uh, to fight against European heretics. <clears throat> this is a call for war against heresy that leads us to the uh, Albigensian Crusade of 12.9. The target of the crusade where the, uh, was to fight against heretics living in southern France, the Cathars were heretics because they believed in reincarnation. They believed the material world was intrinsically evil. Um, the Pope calls for a Western Knights to go and attack the Cathar heretics to wipe them out. Um, and they round them up, and the Cathars refuse to reject their beliefs and embrace Orthodox Christianity. And uh, they don't do this, and they're put to the death by sword or being burned alive. And we can see that he's expanding his power over ordinary individuals and how they act and believe. Now, about the rule of the Roman Catholic Church as an institution in the lives of people in the Middle Ages, one of the things, the church definitely defines people's lives from the birth to death, and they're welcomed into the church through ceremonies of baptism shortly after birth, and of course, when a person's about to die, they call for a priest to give them last rites. In between, the church serves as the focal point of life, and we can see how powerful the church is in some of the church buildings that are left. So I have an image to show the Gothic style of architecture that was popular during the High Middle Ages, and if you're able to go to a... And this is done deliberately as a means to encourage you to look towards heaven where God dwells. So this is the very nature of these buildings was meant to give the person entering them a sense of awe and wonder that would be reverent before God. But we can also see that there's a more hum human perspective that building these kinds of structures would also take an enormous amount of time and an enormous amount of money. And so there's also 
helps us see the church plays a central role in people's lives and is able to get communities to work together to build these amazing structures. The other thing that we've seen throughout this lesson is that during the high middle ages that popes were expanding their powers, not only become powerful in terms of spiritual roles, but also starting to become politically powerful in the conflicts between kings and popes in the high middle ages. More often than not, the popes are the ones who are kind of coming out of these conflicts um, on top, but if the pope becoming politically powerful, it kind of, this kind of power can lead to corruption. Eventually, we see, because the church becomes so powerful, corruption is going to come into the church, leadership is going to be an issue that prompts calls for religious reform. So when we start looking at that re religion in the late Middle Ages, which is going to be part of the next series of lessons, we'll get a chance to see how things start going badly for the church, and their power is going to start declining. We're going to see calls for change, however, before we get to the late Middle Ages, our, which is going to be in our next lesson, um, <clears throat> where the church and state do cooperate during the time of the Crusades.